they look at the research that we've done and they find out that in fact the products do work. So hopefully what we're doing is we're changing the level of awareness on the planet about these types of technologies and your job in trying to uh, invent and market and promote free energy devices, hydrogen supplies for automobiles, whatever it is that you're going to do, hopefully we're making your job a little bit easier. So uh, this is going to be a very practical, uh, hands-on presentation. I'm not going to share with you what I believe or what I think. I'm going to share with you exactly uh, many of the details about what I did to go from having a prototype product uh, to generating the kind of sales that I've, that I've represented. And uh, there's going to be time at the end uh, for questions and answers. So you have a great idea, and you think it is worth millions. Well, maybe it is, and maybe it isn't. And we'll see why. So how do you go about making your millions? I have uh, very often met inventors that have said to me, I don't care about making money. All I want to do is uh, make the world a better place. And I, I think that's great. I think it's wonderful to be altruistic. But the truth of the matter is that this world operates on money. And that if you have an invention that can improve the quality of life, you have to make a business out of it. And actually, one of the secrets is you have to give other people a motivation for helping you. And very often, that motivation is financially based. So we're going to talk about how to go about doing that, how to get other people involved with helping you market and promote your invention. Well, here's the short version. Uh, I've been inventing products for over 20 years. When I got out of college, I was inventing uh, medical devices for a small company in New Jersey. And over the course of the last uh, 20, 25 years, I've designed uh, new methods of uh, producing hydrogen, uh, new methods of generating oxygen, is actually uh, developing these products for the United States Navy, uh, new types of power generation systems. I even developed uh, a number of Tesla bladeless turbine systems that work very, very well. As a matter of fact, I was a little bit torn this evening uh, because as an inventor, I would love to be able to spend time sharing with you uh, some of the ways that I invent products and a number of the, the products that I have invented over the years. But I'm hoping that this information will help you a lot more. So about 10 years ago, um, I was developing products for the Navy. And these were through government contractors. OK, now I have a rule. When I'm on stage speaking, if anyone's cell phone goes off, they have to come on stage and sing. And I think we all That's the spirit. And it's a Friday night, so we can use the entertainment. All right, so um, I was developing products for the Navy, and I was doing it through government contractors. And uh, here's what happened. I'll tell you a little bit more about this. Is I had moved to Atlanta, and I had joined an inventors club. And I already had a very successful business. Uh, I owned uh, two computer businesses. I owned a manufacturing plant with a business partner in uh, Taiwan. And so I was doing that full time. And as a hobby, I, enjoy, I joined an inventors club uh, because I loved inventing and I wanted to be able to share my inventions with people, uh, not to make any money, but just for fun. And I was uh, approached by a group of people and they said, well, we have some money and we want to market new technologies and we like what you've got. And so we want to take these to market. And uh, uh, a number of my business partners, one of them specifically, was a retired engineer from the Department of Defense. Another was a retired engineer from uh, the Department of Energy. And they had contacts uh, with a number of government contractors. And uh, so we ended up uh, being able to uh, present these contractors with new technologies, and it was great. Because uh, one of the things that you learn about the military is that they're very open-minded. How many of you ever invented something only to run into a wall of skepticism by people that you've spoken to? Yes? Yeah. Well, you know what? In the military, it doesn't really work that way. When you go see a company like General Dynamics or a Newport New Shipbuilding, 
uh, General Electric, Raytheon, any of these companies, uh, if you have a working prototype and you have proof, they're not skeptical. What they want to know is how can we take what you've got and implement that into a submarine or a tank or an aircraft or whatever. So it's great that they're not skeptical to a degree. On the other hand, I don't know if you know this or not, but the time that it takes, from the time that you invent and develop a new technology and try to get it on a submarine, uh, about, unless it's a weapon system, the shortest amount of time is seven years. But it can go out to about 20 years. So, um, that's the downside. So if we want to make money with our inventions, I don't recommend that you go through the military. I recommend that you sell to the general public. It'll be a lot easier, and you're going to find out why. So in any case, I developed uh, a new type of oxygen supply for the Navy. Uh, it was a very small, portable oxygen supply to be used in the case of emergencies. And uh, the problem was this device wasn't supposed to work. And uh, if you've seen those cylinders that are pressurized anywhere from 3,000 to 6,000 PSI that firemen carry on their back that weigh about 30 pounds, uh, I developed a little cylinder that weighed about two pounds that could provide someone with four hours worth of oxygen. That's compared to 30 minutes to an hour for one of those cylinders. So my device wasn't supposed to work, but it did. And uh, as a result, I got invited uh, to be part of the design team for one of the Navy's next generation mini subs. And uh, this mini sub was being manned uh, by Navy SEALs and uh, at that time, they were using caffeine, uh, amphetamines, pep pills, and they still do, uh, to boost energy levels. And so I thought, you know, I'm really, uh, I have an objection to this because I've been interested in health and fitness my entire life. And there's got to be a better way that we can improve energy and stamina. So I started to uh, do research on my own. I never got any money from the government because I wanted to retain ownership of the technology, which turned out to be a great thing. And uh, over a period of time, I developed lightweight technology. And I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, uh, because uh, Dr. Holtelanger did an outstanding job of, of presenting this earlier. But basically, this is a technology, it's a passive technology that you apply to your body. It's activated by your body heat, and it emits wavelengths of light that stimulate different chemical reactions in our cells. So as an example, instead of having to take a vitamin pill to elevate your antioxidant levels, we can apply a patch and it can transmit specific information to the body that will elevate glutathione, the body's master antioxidant. And it does it many, many times more efficiently than a vitamin pill. Uh, the problem with that is when you go to tell people about it, they usually don't believe you. Okay, so a little bit more information to continue. But what happened over a period of about seven, eight years is that I went from having this uh, prototype of the patch technology uh, where today uh, we have over 20,000 square feet of manufacturing. Now, our products uh, are not only registered in the United States with the FDA, but they're also registered uh, in every country that we do business in. So we operate completely legally. Uh, we have an FDA-registered manufacturing facility in the United States. And as a matter of fact, we just opened up a manufacturing facility in Europe. We have global locations. Uh, we have a 14,000-square-foot customer service center and order fulfillment center in Atlanta. Uh, we're just opening up a order fulfillment and customer service center in uh, Europe. Uh, we have an office in uh, Taiwan, distribution facilities in Singapore, uh, Malaysia, uh, Taiwan, Australia. You get the idea, all over the place. Uh, we have multiple websites. By the end of this year, we're going to have our website in 20 different languages. And we have a very, very sophisticated infrastructure of management, manufacturing, operations, marketing, 
And none of this happened overnight. And I'll be the first one to tell you that I made a lot of mistakes along the way. But yet, in spite of myself, I still became successful because I had a lot of help. And we'll talk about that. And I'll tell you, I would like to, um, I would like to publicly thank Dr. Haltewanger because uh, he and I have known each other about eight years now. And he has just done a masterful job uh, at organizing all of our clinical research. As a matter of fact, today, we have close to 40 clinical studies. And we have about half a dozen of those uh, that are published in peer review. Uh, we have about another uh, 15 or 20 that are out for peer review right now. And uh, what this does is it takes the skeptics and they have to look at this and say, well, wait a minute, if there's, if there's this much research, independent research behind it, there's got to be something. And plus, over time, we've had Olympic athletes use the products. Uh, professional athletes, everyday people all over the world give us testimonials. And when you accumulate these things, you start to push the skeptics away. I'll tell you about a funny story. I was in Italy, and I had a meeting with 30 medical doctors. And I'm not a medical doctor. And they were asking me different questions about the technology. And you see, you can imagine over a period of about eight years, uh, you hear every question possible that you're ever going to get. And um, we had some skeptics in the room. And um, one of them said to me, well, I want to do my own research because even though you've got 30 or 40 clinical studies, I don't believe it and I want to do my own, my own research to prove that this works. And I said, I said to her, great, I'm glad that you want to do that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to fund your research, and I'm going to prove to you that the technology works. And she was shocked. Uh, she was shocked because I was willing to pay money to her to prove that the technology worked. And what I was going to get out of it was uh, a prominent medical doctor in Italy. I was going to get out of it a peer-reviewed study from a skeptical party, and I was probably going to end up having a new distributor as well. I had another skeptic uh, that Dr. Steve and I dealt with in Iceland, and this was a prominent doctor, and uh, there was a, a, an ad, not an ad, there was an article on the front page of a newspaper in Iceland bashing lightweight. And we were trying to get into the market in Iceland and market there. And this doctor came out and said, Lightwave is a scam. The patches are a fraud. I don't believe they work. That it couldn't possibly work based on the principle that they're describing and don't buy it. So I wrote a letter to the newspaper. And the letter was published on the front page. And I offered a challenge to this doctor. And the challenge was, I'm going to fly to Iceland. And I'm going to bring with me doctors and equipment. And we are going to do a public demonstration of the patches there with the newspaper and the TV and with the present. And I'm going to bring a doctor from NASA. I'm going to bring uh, a United States Olympic doctor with me. And uh, I'm going to fund this whole thing. And if Lightwave is a fraud, you can publish that on the front page of the newspaper and on TV, and uh, it won't cost you a dime. But if we prove that Lightwave works, you're going to pay for the whole thing. <laughs> and you can guess he turned us down, and we have a very big, thriving business in Iceland today. <laughs> so that's one of the ways that you can deal with skeptics. Don't let skeptics derail you, and please don't let anyone steal your dreams. Okay, so how did I do this? How did I get in this position that Lightwave is in today, where we went from uh, just having this prototype technology, where today we've done over $100 million in sales, and we're, we're doubling and tripling uh, each year of our business. So we have very, very healthy growth uh, despite the economy. 
And more importantly, how are you going to be able to take this information and market and sell your own invention? That's what this is all about. I'm going to give you some practical examples on how to do that. Now, remember, if you're not interested in making money, that's fine. But if you want to get your product out to market, you have to make a business out of it. And if you end up making money, great. Donate it to charity. Or start your own charity. Oops. Okay. So what's the first thing that you should do? Now, I'm going to make the assumption that you already have an invention. So this is not going to be a workshop on how to invent. Uh, we're going to talk about once you have your invention, what do you do? So we're making that assumption. The first thing that you need to do is start asking a lot of questions. And there are many. I'd love to show them to you. There we go. All right. Here are some of the important questions. First, how can you manufacture this product, regardless of what it is? Maybe you uh, have a small workshop and you've created a prototype and you've demonstrated that this works, but just because you built one in your garage or your lab or your office doesn't mean that that's going to be a place where you can manufacture these. You have to think about how many of these am I going to sell if I'm successful? Who is going to manufacture it? How much is it going to cost for me to set up the manufacturing? How much will the product cost? Okay, we want to start to ask these questions and see if we can get answers to them. Who is going to buy my product? That seems like a strange one. I'm going to say something that's going to sound a little harsh, but it really isn't. Let's say that you invent a free energy device. Nobody cares. And I'm going to tell you why. Nobody cares because if you go to your neighbor, who probably already thinks you're crazy anyway, that's what happens. All right? You're going to go to your neighbor and you're going to say, Bob, guess what? I just invented a free energy device. Bob doesn't care. If you go to Bob and you say, Bob, I just invented a way where I can run my car off of water. And I no longer spend money on gasoline. Ah, now you've translated your invention into a benefit that Bob, the customer, can understand. He's got a way of saving money and not paying for gasoline. That's a benefit that he can understand. He probably doesn't understand quantum mechanics or zero point energy or vacuum fluctuations, but he does understand that he's got to spend $100 a week on gasoline to put in his truck. And that if he can put water in, he's going to save a lot of money. That whole thing about making the environment clean, that's a side benefit because it's going to make Bob the customer feel really good about his decision to buy your invention. So you have to think about this in a little bit different way. You put yourself in the shoes of the person that's going to spend their hard-earned money on your invention. Why will they buy it? And much of the time, it will be some type of benefit that pertains to them. It's going to improve their health. It's going to save them money. Okay? So that's why people are buying products, not because it's zero point energy. That's only the way that it accomplishes the goal. How will people know about the product? This is also really important. Uh, when I started out, I tried many different ways of marketing and advertising until I found a method that was successful. The first time out, I wasn't successful. Not even the second and the third and I think the fourth. But I kept at it until I found a way to market the products and how to tell people about it. Okay. And the big one. How much time and money is this all going to take? This is an important one, of course. Because, um, okay. um, while you may think that you have the best invention ever, not everyone is going to necessarily feel that way. Because maybe it doesn't have a benefit for that person. 
Let's say that you invented an anti-gravity flying saucer. Well, you know what? Not everyone is going to be interested. I'll probably be one of the first customers to come to me and I'll buy one. Okay? But not everyone is going to be interested. It's not going to mean anything to some people. So it's very important that we identify who is actually interested in buying. That's going to help you out a great deal. And um, will people pay money for this? And again, if we've come up with a new way of producing energy, uh, maybe not everyone is interested in buying it. It all depends on what it is that we say about it, how we say it. Market research. So you've invented a, a free energy device and you think that everybody now is going to be interested in this and buying it. Well, uh, this is what market research is going to tell you. Are people going to buy my product? And how much are they willing to spend? And if you really do good market research, you can even break that down by country. So you can find out what parts of the world are going to be good places to advertise. Of course, we can advertise on the internet. Now, market research can cost you, I've seen it for as little as $500 uh, for uh, internet searches, or I use a, a professional firm in San Diego, and when I have a new product that comes out, it'll typically cost me about $10,000 to have a uh, market research report generated, but it's worth every penny. Now, you don't have to spend that money to an agency. You can do this yourself, and it's not difficult. Now, the next thing is you need a plan. If you were gonna set out to build a home, I would hope that you would have blueprints. If you're going to build an engine, unless you're like Tesla who built everything in his head first, and that's a wonderful gift, and many of you may have that gift, uh, probably you have some type of blueprint or written plan. Well, it's exactly the same thing with a business. Don't start a business without a plan because you're probably going to fail. You, have to, you don't have to have a complete business plan. Although, if you're going to try to raise money, you need a business plan. That's what an, an investor is going to want to see. Okay, that's what they care about. They want to know how they're going to make money off of this. So, if you go to somebody for money, be prepared to give them your plan for how they are going to make money on your invention. That's what they want to see. So, in this plan, you're going to want to ask yourself, some of the same types of questions when you started. Who is going to manufacture the product? Are you going to do it or someone else? Maybe you'll start out manufacturing the product yourself. That's actually what I did. I would uh, wake up about 7 o'clock in the morning. I would get to my desk, which was a home office, at 9 o'clock. I would start calling people, uh, doctors, uh, medical doctors, chiropractors, acupuncturists, physical therapists, athletes, trainers. I'd wrap up about 6 o'clock at night, have dinner, go to sleep, and then at 1 o'clock in the morning, I would wake up, I would go into my lab, I would make patches, I would quit about 5 a.m., and then go to sleep for another two hours and get back up at 7 and repeat the cycle. This is what I did for about a year and a half so that I had prototypes to go out and sell. And it took about, gosh, around 14, 15 months, something like that, to uh, set up our manufacturing plant to where we could make these in uh, large volume. And today, we produce millions of these things. Um, how much money is it going to take to set up manufacturing? If you do it yourself, depending on what type of invention it is, it could cost millions of dollars. So you're probably going to want to go to a, a contract manufacturer and get a company to make it for you. And there's some really cool ways of orchestrating a business deal so you don't have to spend a lot of money out of your pocket to do this. How much will the product cost to manufacture? I spoke with an inventor once, and he had invented a new technology. And I said, um, how much will it cost to make your invention? And he said, oh, this will cost pennies. 
I said, how do you know this? And he said, well, you know, I went to uh, Home Depot to buy the parts, and I spent, you know, a uh, couple dollars on the parts, so I figured if you make this in large volume, it's going to cost pennies. And I said, well, I don't know how you figure things, but uh, you're going to have to pay people, you're going to need a facility, uh, let's not even get into business taxes and uh, product liability insurance and accounting costs and legal costs and all these other things, okay? But these are things you have to take into consider. How much is the product actually going to cost? It's not always what you think. So we have to factor these things in so that we can make money on what it is that we're selling. Should you get a patent? Um, I used to spend a lot of money on patents, and I don't like patents. Um, because one of the things that you find out that is a harsh reality about patents, let's say that you're successful in getting one, it's probably going to cost you about a million dollars to defend the patent, maybe more. So if you're already up and running and you're a successful business, uh, you know, that may be fine, but what's far better is to protect your technology with trade secrets. Now, if it's a mechanical device, uh, you could file a provisional patent. Now, you only get a year worth of protection, but the good thing is, until you actually start making money at your business, you don't have to spend thousands of dollars getting a patent, just keep renewing that provisional patent, it'll be in place, and it will save you a lot of time and money. Um, you're going to need a good lawyer and an accountant, but you don't need one right away. Okay? Don't go out and hire a lawyer that's going to charge you three or four hundred bucks an hour to hear their opinion on something they've never done before. Uh, don't hire an accountant until you're actually making money. You, want, you need to have all these things uh, because you have to pay taxes, you need to have your business run properly, you need a lawyer to protect you from certain things, uh, but some of these costs you can put out to a later date. Where are you going to work from? I worked out of a home office for about two years, and I will tell you that was the difference between being successful and not. I was tempted to get an office to work out of just from the point of view of the image of the business, which later on became very, very important. Uh, but initially I didn't. For about two years, I saved money. I took a, a spare bedroom uh, out of my home. I converted it over into an office, and it worked very, very well for me. Uh, will you market? How are, how are you going to market the product? Uh, are you going to do it through a retail store, through TV, through word of mouth, through the newspaper, uh, on the internet? Okay, so we want to start listing these things. Um, I know all of us hope that our efforts are going to be wildly successful and that we think we're going to sell millions of units. And maybe we will, but it doesn't necessarily start out that way. So one of my the advice I could pass on to you is start small but plan big. So start out as small as you can so you have a greater chance of success, but put a plan in place so that when you do become successful, you have a plan that you can activate for manufacturing more of your units or expanding your facilities, any aspect of the business. Okay, so on and on. Um, Customer service is another important issue. You know, often what we think about is now that we've got a product and we sold it to someone, uh, that's it. Well, there's a lot more to the story. What happens when someone has a question? Maybe they, you know, they buy your home power unit and uh, it doesn't work the way they, they thought, or uh, they don't know how to install it. They don't know what, how to adjust it, whatever the case may be. You need to be prepared for some type of customer service. How are you going to address people's needs? And that's very, very important for a business because the, the better your customer service, the more apt people are to buy from you and to recommend your company to other people. So again, these are things to keep in mind. You don't need to have a customer service department when you start, but it needs to be part of your planning. 
how are you going to take money from people? You know, it would be really nice if everyone would just pay you in cash. But unfortunately, we know that uh, most people want to pay by credit cards. Uh, the good news is that uh, you can start out small, and uh, many companies uh, will start out and allow you to accept credit card transactions up to a total of about $30,000 in business uh, per month. So uh, fortunately, uh, those mechanisms are there and they're on the internet that you can learn about that. And how much money is this all going to cost? And based on how much money is required to do this, will have a dramatic impact on your planning. Now, one of the things that I learned as an inventor was that I would never talk about one of my inventions until I had a working prototype. And like many of you, I learned uh, that to hard way. I had invented a new battery technology. And I thought this was the coolest battery technology in the world because it was uh, powered by heat. So you could literally uh, put that battery on a desktop and after it was dead, and it would recharge itself just sitting there. And I went to Raya back, and uh, I didn't have a working prototype uh, that I brought with me, and I didn't have an independent lab uh, that had certified this and tested it. And I listened to my business partner, and he talked to me into going to Raya back and making a demonstration. And uh, I got beat up by these six PhDs in electrochemistry, and they threw me out in the dead of winter because uh, uh, Ray Back is in Wisconsin, and it was freezing that day. And uh, I walked out of the building saying to myself, I will never do this again. I will never do that again. Thank you, John. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate the sympathy. So, he pays me. <laughs> so uh, so uh, the next time an opportunity came up, it was uh, at General Dynamics Electric Boat. I was up in Groton, Connecticut. And as a matter of fact, I, I had developed uh, with my team a, a, tef, a Tesla bladeless turbine system. And uh, we had this wonderful combustion chamber uh, that, was, that was quite novel. And we could run the Tesla turbine on uh, steam or propane or diesel. And I was giving this PowerPoint presentation to about 30 engineers. And you can imagine, these guys are brilliant. And uh, one of them stood up and said, this thing will never Thank you for your time. And uh, my response was, uh, you know, a lot of people, I can understand why they'd be skeptical about the principle, but I brought a video with me of our prototype uh, working in the lab, and I'd like to show that video now. And uh, I did, and their questions went from, we don't believe it works, to how does this work? We want to understand what you did. And believe me, that's a good feeling. So. Um, I bring that up to say that if you are going to approach people for money, and please do not go to your family and friends, okay? Go to, I know it's tempting, but don't do it. Uh, go to, a, uh, go to uh, an investor, a professional investor. Most of them are sharks, uh, but you can find good ones. Um, but you want to have a working device. And what I mean by that is you want to have something that you is either ready to uh, market and sell, it's in its finished form, or it's very, very close to its finished form. Where there's no, there's no development involved, this is something that you can actually take and market and sell. And again, you want to have a detailed plan. When you go sit with someone and they're going to, and you're, they're going to entrust you with their money, they're going to want to know how much money do you need, how are you going to spend it? And how am I going to get my money back with interest? Okay, that's what they want to know, and that's fair. If someone was going to uh, borrow money from me, I'd want to know the same thing. How are you going to spend it? What's your plan? And how am I going to get my money back? And plus make some money. So start small. Um, how many of you were here uh, last night to see John Sorrell? He's fantastic, isn't he? And we, we owe a lot to him. Uh, I know he was described as being, I think, the grandfather or the great-grandfather of uh, free energy. I always thought of him as the grandfather of anti-gravity, but uh, 
the free energy works for me too. But you know, when I look at, at what he's got, it's absolutely massive, and he's spent God, I don't know how many decades trying to uh, trying to work on this and uh, get something out to market. And I hope he succeeds for all our sakes. Um, but I think if I was going to do something like that, I would take the technology down to the smallest size possible. And I would do that because it would cost a lot less money to make a little device like this as compared to the massive thing that he's trying to build. Now that's assuming, of course, that it will work at that type of scale. Okay, well, fair enough. But the working principle that I, I saw with him, that he demonstrated, I think he could demonstrate on a fairly small scale. Maybe make a toy out of it, uh, sell it for uh, research purposes, what have you. But in any case, whatever example we're, we're talking about, take it down to the smallest size possible, or the smallest scale possible. If it's a, a power generation system, and uh, you know, you've got this thought of, well, we want to power a home with this device, and maybe you can do it. But from the point of view of manufacturing, don't start out at the level of 15 kilowatts or 25 kilowatts. Take it down to something a little bit smaller, maybe 500 watts or 1,000 watts. Because it's going to cost a lot less money to manufacture these units. Once you're manufacturing them, you've got cash flow. And believe me, once you've got cash coming in the door, all of a sudden, you're independent. I started with one product, and one product only, and today we had eight products. I didn't start out trying to set up a manufacturing line with millions of dollars worth of equipment. And by the way, I just spent $3 million setting up a manufacturing plant in Ireland. So this isn't cheap. But I didn't start out with going out and trying to uh, borrow $3 million or $5 million from someone to do this. I started at the smallest scale possible with one product. And I, I uh, started with a very, very small manufacturing uh, capability. So we could produce a few units at a time. And as the money started to come in, we started to ramp up the manufacturing. And we learned a lot in the process. And today, we can crank out thousands of packages of our product each day, and it's fully automated, and, uh, and I like it a lot. All right, so no offense to anyone here named John, who's an inventor. That just happened to be what I thought of at the time. So oh, that's right, we've got one over here. Uh, John, the inventor, has just developed a new free energy motor and he's very excited about the invention, and he knows it's going to change the world. And uh, he wants to sell this to everyone. And he's only going to need $50 million in investment capital to start the new company. And he figures everyone is going to be as excited as he is about this, and people are just going to throw money at it. Mary, the inventor, because I believe in equal rights between sexes, will so I think women can be inventors too, right? Do we have any female inventors here in the crowd? Wonderful. So Mary, the inventor, has just developed a free energy device, and she's excited about her invention. She thinks it can change the world. And uh, she's going to use this device to recharge the batteries on computers. And uh, to make this happen, she's going to need about $100,000. You may find this surprising, actually. Uh, but today, it's actually easier to borrow more money than smaller amounts of money. It's just the way the conditions of our economy. I went to someone and uh, I went for a line of credit of uh, $3 million or $5 million, and the investor came back and said, we'll only do the deal if you'll take $25 million. <laughs> and uh, I turned it down because I didn't need the money and I don't want to pay interest on $25 million. <laughs> And, uh, but that's the conditions of the economy today. Uh, the people that have money, they have a lot of it, and they want to invest in uh, companies that are on a, on a fairly large scale and uh, make a very big investment in return. 
but you can find angel investors that will invest smaller amounts of capital. Um, and this is a good thing because this, even though it's uh, still $100,000, the meetings generally can be more casual, have a business plan, uh, be able to describe uh, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, how much time it's going to take. Be prepared and have the answers to the questions. The investor will be very impressed and you're going to stand a good chance of getting the money. And uh, in the early days of Lightwave, that's exactly what I did. I realized that I was going to need uh, money, and I, I had my own savings, and I did spend my own money on getting the company started. Uh, but I started to show the patch technology to uh, business friends and business associates. I never went to family. I never went to personal friends. And um, I ended up uh, being able to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars in investment capital because, I hope that's applause was for me, uh, because I had a plan. I had a working uh, prototype, I had a working product, and I had a plan. And uh, one of the investors that I went to, by the way, he, in he invested about $200,000 or so. and. Um, he didn't believe that the patches were real. Uh, he thought it was a con. And uh, he ended up hiring Dr. Haltylanger to prove that the technology was a fake. <laughs> and uh, over the course of two days, we spent six hours on the phone. And uh, at the end of that time, uh, Dr. Haltylanger said to me, this is the most exciting thing I've ever seen. Can I have a job? <laughs> so, uh, we've been friends ever since. Okay, how am I doing on time? Am I doing okay? Time's up. All right, you guys want to hear some more? Yeah. We haven't even gotten to the good part. Sorry this is taking so long. Now, you may not need as much money as you think, or you may need more money, but uh, I'd like to get into this concept of um, try to produce a product that you can sell as quickly as possible. One of the things I've seen people make a mistake with is they're always in the mode of trying to raise money. And raising money is not necessarily, trying to go out and raise money isn't necessarily a bad thing. I did it. But you want to have a clear and direct plan for how you're going to generate cash. Because I will tell you that cash produces independence. And you've probably already guessed it with doing over $100 million in sales, I'm very independent today, and I like it. As an inventor, I like being independent. I like being able to do what I love, which is invent for a living. And I really love being able to see people benefit from the product that I invented. I love that, and that's, so, so life for me is very enjoyable. But I had this idea that I didn't want to constantly be in the mode of raising money. And I had you know, a good suspicion at the time when I produced the product that there were going to be many other products that I could create. But I drove a stake and I said, I've, I've got something that works and I'm going to sell it. And after I'm successful selling this, I can take whatever profit I have and I can put it into more research, more studies, more product development, and, uh, and go from there. And, uh, and that's exactly what happened. As a matter of fact, we've spent uh, well over a million dollars to date on clinical studies. And uh, it's actually accelerating. Each year, our budget uh, dramatically increases. And uh, the reason is because we're, we learn an awful lot about our products uh, when you apply more than one of them on the body at the, at the same time, we're learning about some very dramatic anti-aging effects. Uh, we're learning about new products that can develop as a result of the research. And um, when I have a skeptic come to me and they say, does your, your technology work? Uh, I really like it when I can get show them 40 studies as compared to two or three. Because you can knock down two or three studies pretty easily. But when you've got 40 studies that are from all over the world, it's pretty hard to knock it. All right, next what we want to do is work the plan. 
it's great if you invented your product and you thought about how you're going to do all these things. But if you uh, if you uh, sit on your sofa at night and watch TV and you don't put any time into uh, into your plan, it's never going to happen. We have a fellow that lives in California. Um, as I mentioned, we have distributors uh, all over the world in about 90 countries for a product. And uh, one of the most successful is in California. And, uh, and he makes a lot of money each year. And if you ask him, how did he become so successful? He would tell you, I do very basic things over and over and over again. Every day when I get up, I pick up the phone and I have on my list, I'm going to call 30 or 40 people. And I'm going to make a business presentation every day. Sometimes I'll, I'll make a breakfast presentation, a lunch presentation, a dinner presentation. But he does this over and over and over again every day. So he takes very simple things and he keeps repeating them. You have to do the same thing. It, these things that we're, we're talking about aren't necessarily difficult or complicated. They may, see, they may seem overwhelming to you right now. But if you were going to build a house, you wouldn't start out trying to build the entire thing at once. You would start out laying the foundation and maybe, I don't know how to build a house, but putting in the plumbing and then the wiring and framing. working the framing and all that kind of stuff, insulation, whatever the hell you do to build a house. Okay? But the point is, uh, you do it one piece at a time. And owning and operating a successful business is the same thing. Okay? I wasn't an expert and didn't know how to do a lot of this stuff when I started. Much of it I learned along the way. I had been a business owner for many years before this, so there were many things that I knew. But there were other things that I, that I learned along the way. But the important thing was I worked at it every day. Now, I was able to, uh, I already had a company, so I was already a business owner, and I was able to leave the business that I owned with uh, business partners and set up Lightweight and run it full time. I was able to do that off of my savings. While I ran it off of my savings, I was able to generate investment capital. So I was very fortunate. But I had a plan and I worked it. And I put this in there to emphasize this. You've got to take action on what happens. The plan needs to be organic, especially with the type of technologies that we're talking about. If you set out to market, let's say you've invented a uh, new hydrogen system, and you set out to market this hydrogen system as a booster for an automobile. And I'll use that as an example because we have some inventors here trying to do that. And I think that's a wonderful project, and I, I wish you all the best of luck. So let's say that you start out to do that, and somewhere along the way, you find a company is interested in taking your technology and applying it to a generator set, like a home power unit, and manufacturing it and marketing it for that application. Should you stick to your business plan and only market it for automobiles, or should you deviate from your business plan and try to market it and sell it to this other company that wants to go out and manufacture and do all those other things? What do you think? Grow. You keep it organic. You adapt and you flow like water to change. Okay, and that's that's okay. These things are going to come up. You can do this until you find the path that works. So be willing, even though you've got a plan, be willing to be flexible and change the plan where it's necessary. Now, um, when I was putting this together, uh, what I was thinking about was a number of different examples uh, that I could use uh, to show you about how you go from uh, having an invention and then actually making money with it and I decided to use my own company uh, as an example because I know it thoroughly. And, um, and I was in your shoes of having a product that's highly controversial. And that if you ask most people about it, they say, oh, I don't know if that really works. 
And I've developed many uh, such technologies over my career that uh, were very, very difficult for people to believe. Uh, but I had working prototypes, and uh, I was able to be quite successful with that. So David invents a new technology for improving health, for improving energy. And the products are in the form of non-transdermal patches, meaning nothing goes in the body. And people have a hard time of understanding how could that possibly work. All I have is my invention, and I know it works. So how am I going to go out and prove to the world that it works, and how am I going to make money? All right. Uh, sorry if you can't read this. Uh, so, what did I do? I started to ask myself some questions. How am I going to manufacture this product? Well, what I started to do was call companies. And I started to do research and find out how are transdermal patches manufactured? Smokers patches, the kind of stuff that puts drugs or chemicals or herbs into the body, weight loss patches. I wanted to find out something similar. Uh, how that was being manufactured. So I started to call companies, and I found out that the equipment uh, to make those products were about a million dollars. So I wasn't going to do that. And I, I started to call companies and uh, find out what all my options were for making this product. Uh, I wanted to know how much it was going to cost to make. So I started to uh, make a list of all of the materials that went into product. I started to call suppliers to find out how much would it cost uh, to get the product in large volume. I started to try to calculate, well, if I can manufacture this number of patches over this period of time, and I know that I'm going to have to pay somebody you know, $10 or $12 an hour to uh, manufacture that, I can start to come up with some costs. Who is going to buy my product? Well, I started to make a list, and I thought, well, I have a product for improving energy and salmon. If you recall, I originally uh, invented this as a way of improving the uh, stamina and energy of uh, special operations. And so I thought, well, who else is interested in improving energy? should be everybody. But I know athletes uh, specifically should be very interested in this, healthcare practitioners should be very interested in this. So I started to make my list, and I started to call these people. Um, how will people know about it? So I have this wonderful product, and uh, even though I've invented it, no one knows about it except me and uh, family and friends. So how am I going to tell the rest of the world about this? Am I going to market it over the internet? Uh, am I going to advertise it on radio, on TV, and newspaper, uh, in a retail store? And uh, most of these things I've tried, and I found out what works and what doesn't. Uh, I was even at GM City, and I got a deal offer from them that I turned down. Uh, why will people buy my product? And it's not always what you think. Just because you have a device that produces more energy out than what goes into it, that in and of itself is not necessarily a benefit in the mind of the person that you want to sell it to. The person that's going to buy the product has to have a reason for buying it. So that when you're telling someone about it, you should put it in the terms of a benefit. So it's not that you have a free energy device. It's that you have a device, so now your car can run on water, and you no longer have to pay for gasoline. Does that make sense? It's really important. Does that make sense? You guys fall asleep on me here? All right, great. Just wanted to check in. All right. OK, the market research. Um, so I couldn't afford to hire a market research company, so I started to make calls every day. I mentioned I was getting up at about 7 o'clock in the morning, hitting my home office from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. I was making telephone calls and going out and seeing people. And I was demonstrating the product. 
And you're going to learn a lot by doing this. So let's say that you had a device that you could uh, run a car on water. You would make your list. Maybe you're going to show mechanics. Maybe you're going to take this to uh, different businesses. Maybe you want to take it to a mall and put a banner out in the parking lot. Whatever it is that you want to do. But you, you need to start listening to what people are saying about your invention. And please don't take it personally. I know that we feel like uh, we feel like uh, expectant mothers or parents who have given birth okay, now to this beautiful invention and we're very much attached to it. And when people are uh, skeptical or critical, it's very easy to become angry. And don't let that happen. Try to take that as an opportunity to improve your invention. So let's say that you have a device that works, and now you've got your car that's running off of water, and someone says, well, gee, you know, you, you made your device uh, white, and I'd really rather have it be green, because green is, is uh, ecological and it's friendly. Or you built it out of plastic, and you could have made it out of something else, or whatever. Listen to the criticism, and learn from it, and use it to improve on what you have. Okay, because this is all consumer, product, uh, consumer feedback. These are the people that are gonna buy your product, and if they have objections to buying a product, you wanna be able to answer those objections as best you can. So take each objection, answer it, and then move on to other stuff. And what you're going to find after you've refined your invention is pretty soon there aren't any objections left, and now people are buying your product. Um, I looked on the internet as part of my research to find out who the competition was. So I have a product for improving energy and stamina. That's the first product that I invent and start to manufacture. Who's the competition? Vitamin supplements. At that time, there were, uh, and still are, bracelets on the market for improving energy. It was Q-Ray, q, -ray, q those companies for pendants. So I started to look at how much, are the, how much money are these companies charging? Are they successful at doing this? Uh, and you start to ask people, what are they willing to pay for? You can either ask them directly or you start to test market in different price ranges. And you begin to learn what are people going to actually pay for your product and can you afford to make money if you sell it at that price. Now, if I invented a device for uh, free energy, and let's say I could run my car off of free energy, one of the ways that I would sell it is to show people how much money they would save by buying the product. So I would eliminate the cost of the uh, product as an objection. This is how much money you're going to save. All right, so the research determined uh, who was going to buy the product, uh, how much I could sell it for. I started to get answers to all of this. And um, I would, so once I had these answers, I would need to find a company to manufacture the product because I couldn't, the level of success that I was shooting for, I couldn't make it myself. Um, I would need to uh, test market the patches to, to see how people uh, from different professions would react to them. Um, I would need to test different ways of marketing the patches, which I'm going to show you in a moment. As most people did not understand the technology, I found out that a face-to-face -face approach worked best. So you've got this new technology for improving energy, nothing goes in the body, and no one understands how it works, lay people. And so you can imagine if someone reads about this in a newspaper ad, or on a flyer, or on a brochure, or sitting on a retail shelf, they're not gonna know what it is, how powerful it is, how it can improve their health, and why it's different than 
everything else. They're going to see a patch, and they're going to assume that something goes in the body. So one of the things that I learned that was very, very powerful, it's still how we market today. And it's exactly how we've been able to uh, spread the word about LifeWave around the world is face-to-face -face selling. The most successful distributor in our company is someone that uh, was born into this world as a slave in Africa. It's a true story. This fellow was born in Cameroon. He's in his mid-40s. And uh, he was sold, uh, by the time he was about three or four years old, he was sold as a slave so his parents could make money. And when he became a teenager, he escaped from Cameroon. And uh, he snuck on a boat and went to France and didn't have any money, so it was a bum on the streets, and he was taken in by a family. And uh, they gave him a job as a mechanic. And uh, as fate would have it, a friend of his was introduced to Lightweight and uh, showed him the patches. And he happened to be using our pain relief product at the time and uh, had wonderful results from it. Now this fellow uh, was living in an apartment uh, outside of Paris, or actually in Nice. And uh, he called his landlord and uh, he said, I have uh, got this new product and nothing goes in the body and it's a new technology from the United States and it relieves pain and uh, you really need to take a look at it. And his landlord, uh, who lived in uh, Switzerland, uh, said, well, listen, this has got to be a scam. I don't believe anything like this could work. Send me your stupid patches, and I'm going to prove to you that they don't work. I have a knee, and I haven't been able to bend my knee for 10 years, and I'm in pain for 10 years, and I'm going to prove to you that, that your silly patches don't work. So he, he wanted the, the former slave from Cameroon and sent the patches off to this fellow in Switzerland, and in one minute, this fellow's pain was gone. And he was convinced. Now, what the former slave from Cameroon didn't know was that his landlord had become a multimillionaire in network marketing and had retired, had bad experience with a number of other companies. And uh, when he called back uh, this fellow, he said, uh, I've never experienced anything like this before in my life. And I was retired from network marketing, but I'm going to get back into it uh, because of this product. And uh, within a period of one year, the former slave from Cameroon uh, is now earning over a million dollars a year. And uh, he became uh, so successful that uh, he won a free trip on our company cruise in the Caribbean, which was uh, last November. And uh, he got to meet Suzanne Summers, who was our, one of our guest speakers on this cruise. He went back to Cameroon for the first time in 20 years and uh, got to see his parents, who he hadn't seen. And uh, while he was there, uh, he, uh, he met a woman and uh, got married and took her back to uh, France. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> If a uh, former slave from Cameroon can do it, you can do it too. So the, the whole point behind this uh, was that none of this would have happened without face-to-face -face selling. I actually met Dr. Holtheimer that way. I was introduced to, uh, I had a business friend who introduced me to one of his business friends, and I met uh, one of his business friends, and that fellow ended up hiring Dr. Holtemeyer, and Dr. Holtemeyer had an associate in California that's a medical doctor, and that person ended up introducing the product to someone else. It all worked through face-to-face -face marketing. So it's very, very powerful. I'm a big believer in it because that's how I became successful. It's not the only way, uh, but if you've got something that's revolutionary, it's very difficult for people to understand 
you may find that face-to-face -face selling works well for you as well. Okay, and another thing that I did, and I realize that uh, some of your, uh, these inventions that we're talking about, you may not be able to do this exactly, uh, but because of the nature of my product, by the way, this is my product over here. We're giving out uh, uh, free demonstrations at our lightweight booth. Uh, so you've got any type of uh, nagging pain, we'll be happy to patch you up. It won't cost you anything. And you can try the technology. It takes about one or two minutes. Uh, but I have had a product that was uh, very small, lightweight, easy to ship. And uh, I was able to manufacture this at a cost where I could hand out free samples. And uh, a lot of great things came from that, as, you'll, as you're about to see. So when I started to work the plan, uh, one of the things that I did was I created a working relationship with the company to manufacture the product for me at a price that I could afford. And I don't have the time, unfortunately, to get into every detail uh, about what's happened to me over the last eight years. Otherwise, we'd have a two or three day seminar. Uh, but I was able to create a business relationship that was good for me and good for this company. And uh, I allowed them to make a large amount of profit on the front end. And over time, that relationship has changed. Uh, but to get me started, uh, they, uh, they were able to bear a, a significant amount of the cost into setting up the manufacturing, uh, which, which other companies I, I would have to put up the cost. And uh, as a result, I was able to get it up and running. I started to uh, test market the product. Uh, I would walk into a health, a health food store. I would show the owner. Uh, these are mom and pop stores. I would show the owner my product, do a demonstration, and uh, they would start to sell it. And I did that in exchange for feedback. Uh, later on, I was making money by doing that. Uh, I would meet with many, many different types of doctors, chiropractors, uh, acupuncturists, medical doctors, I went to gyms, I spent a lot of time working with athletes and personal trainers and coaches uh, and collected a lot of uh, very, very valuable feedback, uh, which helped me improve the quality of the product over time. Um, I even found that at this time I lived in Georgia and I found a company that marketed products through infomercials. And at their cost, they filmed an infomercial, and we tested the product uh, on TV. We actually had, Dr. Holtzweiger and I actually had this filmed. We put it up on TV, and it was a huge failure. And the reason why it was a huge failure was that uh, the company attempted to market this. Uh, they did their test marketing on Easter Sunday at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> So how many people do you think are up at 6 o'clock in the morning on Easter Sunday? Nobody. So uh, they came back to us and said, I'm sorry, we didn't get, we got like 10 people that called in you know, to buy the product. So I can't say that was a fair test. Uh, <laughs> but the company actually ended up going bankrupt for other, for other reasons, because they had too, they put too much money into marketing too many different products, and uh, they weren't having success with it. But anyway, that was one of the things that we did. That we tried. Um, I also uh, formed a relationship with a network marketing company that was in Georgia for the purpose of test marketing. And um, that's where we struck gold. They invited me to a meeting in, that they were holding in North Carolina, and they invited me up on stage. Uh, it was in front of about 150 people. And um, they let me show the product and demonstrate it. And after the meeting, uh, people came up to me and were telling me how excited they were about potentially being able to go out and build a business off of this, and sell the product, and that it was very unique and no one else had it. And that's where I figured it out. That's where I figured out that uh, when other people had a financial incentive in my success that uh, this was going to be an ideal way of marketing and distributing the product. 
So think about it. You've created, you've created this product, and it would be awfully tempting to think, well, what I want to do is manufacture it and sell it and make all the money myself. And, and maybe you can do that. But what's much more powerful is to set up a system of distribution, and there's cooperative uh, methods of doing this on the internet, uh, there's conventional retailing, there's many methods of doing it, but the basic concept is that when you get other people involved, and you have a, a network of distribution, and now you have other people that are interested in you being successful because they're going to make money off of it. Now you can multiply your time and effort. So instead of you being the only person that's going out there and marketing your product, now you can have people all over the world. When uh, I go to sleep tonight, there's going to be someone in Spain and Portugal and France and Italy and Switzerland and Israel and Taiwan and Singapore and Malaysia and Australia and many other countries around the world that are going out and holding meetings and marketing a product that I invented. That's pretty cool, right? So think about that as a concept when you're putting this all together. Build this into your plan that you want to have a, uh, a network, a distribution channel, and build in a layer where people can go out and distribute and make money off your product. You will be much more successful than trying to do it on your own. All right, let's see where we are. Uh, some of the things that happened as a result of this were really cool out of the basic plan that I started with, and it, it definitely changed over time. Um, but a number of years ago, we came up with a formula that worked, and we never deviated from it. And that was really important. Once you, once you have figured out the formula for success, don't dare change it. I can't tell you how many people have come to me over the years that have wanted to buy my company, or they have wanted to uh, offer me an opportunity to market the product through some other channel. Once you've got a formula that works, don't change it. Work the formula. There's always bigger and better ways of marketing the product uh, based on the, the formula that you have and taking it to a bigger level. Uh, but once you've got something that works, stick with it. Don't change it then. I'm still using uh, the same manufacturer today that I was when I started eight years ago. And uh, as a matter of fact, I've just taken in a portion of the manufacturing myself and I just built uh, 14,000 square foot facility in Europe. Uh, so I own a facility now uh, in Europe that's doing the manufacturing, and I'm still contracting out to an FDA registered facility in the United States because the relationship has been a very good one. Um, I found out through the test marketing that all the people that were uh, testing the product, they really liked it. They liked this idea that there weren't any drugs and chemicals going into the body, that it was natural, uh, that it was elevating energy and stamina. Uh, now, let's see, I covered some of this. Uh, let's see. And let me show you what happened when I gave away free samples. Yeah. Now, you may not be uh, in the position with your invention to do that because of the nature of the product. Maybe you'll form some other type of relationship where you can accomplish the same goal. But something very, very powerful happened once I got the product out there and people started using it and it didn't cost them anything. Uh, I started to get testimonials from trainers, coaches, and then eventually professional athletes and Olympic athletes. So you can imagine, you're an inventor and you go out and you're telling someone about your product, and the person that you're talking to, maybe they believe you, maybe they don't. But if you hand them a brochure, or you've got a website, and you've got a whole list of testimonials of 10 or 15 people that have used your product or they've seen it, and they've said, wow, you know, this thing really does what this company says, it really works. That's going to go a very, very long way initially knocking down skepticism. 
in getting people to buy and try your product. Um, we have many doctors that started to use the product, which was great because we found out some of the clinical applications of the technology. Uh, many of the clinical studies that we, that we did initially, I didn't have to pay for. Now we've spent over a million dollars uh, today on clinical research, and it's very, very expensive. And there's no way that uh, LifeWave could ever have afforded that early on. So what I did was I went out to universities and I showed them the technology, and I said, I'll tell you what, I'll provide your football team or your baseball team with free product if you let me do a clinical study with your athletes, and if you run the study. And I had uh, two schools. I had Troy University in Alabama, and I had Morehouse College in Atlanta that agreed to that. So we knocked out three clinical studies and demonstrated in a clinical environment that the product works. So now I had an independent source uh, that was verifying that what I had was real. And for any type of invention that you have, if it's not health-related, uh, let's say it's a mechanical device, you absolutely need to have a third-party lab verify what it is that you say. So if you're producing, you know, 10 times over unity or double the amount of power out as of what you've got going in, have a third party verify that. That's your proof to skeptics that what you have is real, and it's very powerful. Um, another thing that happened as a result of giving out free samples was uh, Dr. Hultemeyer and I began to work with a uh, very well-known uh, Olympic coach, Richard Quick, in uh, uh, California. At the time, he was the uh, uh, coach of the women's swim team at Stanford, uh, six-time United States Olympic coach. And uh, within just a few months of uh, Coach Quick getting the free samples and putting them on his athletes, Lightweight made national headlines. And I had all of these patches out there that these athletes were using. And one day, uh, a group of these athletes from the Stanford women's swim team, they try out for a position on the United States Olympic team. And because they're all performing better with the patches, they go to Olympic training camp uh, down in Long Beach, California and they try out with the patches. Now this is in 2004, and back then, about a month earlier, was the Valco scandal. For those of you that don't know what that was, that was the scandal where, uh, where Olympic athletes were being accused of using steroids, and they got the steroids from this company called Valco. And Valco had invented a way of taking flaxseed oil and converting it into a steroid to improve performance, and the steroid didn't show up in a blood or urine testing. And there were a number of famous athletes uh, that got caught for doing that, and uh, that's what was going on at the time. So the other coaches saw these athletes from Stanford wearing the patches, and they accused us of putting drugs into the athletes. So I flew out to California uh, to meet with the uh, U.S. Olympic Committee, uh, United States Olympics, and uh, they took the patches, they had them uh, analyzed by the UCLA Microanalytical Lab, and it was shown that they uh, only contained organic uh, materials. The athletes were drug tested, and they, they showed uh, that they didn't have any type of steroids in their blood or urine, and we were exonerated. And uh, I started getting calls from newspapers, radio stations, wanting to know what was this technology. And to make a long story short, uh, that was in August of 2004 that we started to make national headlines. Now, I had about a thousand people that wanted to be distributors for the product. And so I took a nine-month project, and with a group of people, we condensed it down into about three months, and we were up and running on uh, November 10th 
of 2004. And that month, through a thousand distributors, we did $500,000 in sales. And that's why you don't want to try to sell the product on your own. I had a thousand people out there talking about the product, going out and selling it, and it became a huge success. Uh, as a matter of fact, our very first year in business, we did $17 million in sales. And I think any of you would agree that if you did $17 million in sales your first year, you'd be pretty happy. I went out and bought myself a new Corvette. That's what I wanted, because I like Corvette, like Johnny Carson. Those of you that remember him. All right, so now, obviously at this point, I was off and running. Uh, I had put in about two years uh, from the time that I started. And uh, now we had a basic company that was set up, we were selling, we had a lot of money that was coming in. And what happened after this, and I'm, I'm sharing this with you to emphasize that you don't have to do everything all at once. Okay, you can start small and build and go as you become more successful. So what happened after this uh, was then I started to build a management team, which was very, very difficult. Uh, it took a lot of time to get good people uh, to work at the company and do a good job. Uh, we started a customer service department because people wanted to know uh, where do you put the patches on the body, how often do you use them, um, are, are there any health risks, what if I had a pacemaker, so we needed to have a customer service department. Um, I didn't attempt to do all of this myself. To keep costs down, we started to farm out customer service, order fulfillment, and it ended up being a lot less expensive. Uh, we started to produce marketing materials, we started to do a uh, internet site, and um, we only marketed initially in English and it wasn't until, you know, over the course of a number of years that we began to add other languages to the website and our marketing materials as a way to expand the business. And all of this you're going to learn from your market research. So we found out that the market in the United States was one of the biggest in the world for this product. So I didn't initially have to worry about trying to sell into Portugal or Spain or Taiwan or any of those other places. That came later. Um, we produced marketing materials like brochures, uh, CDs, DVDs. Uh, we had to implement computer systems so that the distributors would know uh, how to make money with this and how to get, uh, tap into our systems. Uh, we had many, many public meetings. Again, this all gets back to the face-to-face -face part. If you got a uh, working prototype of your invention, plan to go out and market it and demonstrate it. When a group of people see something working, okay, they're going to be prone and, and there's a plan in place for them to go out and uh, make money off of it. That's very, very powerful. And then there are uh, all types of additions to the infrastructure, legal, accounting, uh, to get this to work. So uh, where do you go from here? We're wrapping up this. That's a problem. Okay, you got it. All right. So where do you go from here? This is this is the end now. Start with the basics that we discussed. Uh, don't feel like you need to get do everything at once. Uh, be realistic in your goals. Um, be patient and be persistent. So thank you for your time. And good luck.